First Thessalonians chapter 5 is where we're going to be, and we're finishing up this series called Overflow. So if you want to get, uh, get your Bibles open up to First Thessalonians chapter 5, or app on your phone, that's fine as well. First Thessalonians chapter 5 is where we're going to be, and we're going to have some fun, and uh, we're going to learn some things that I believe applies to every single one of us here. About a month ago, I was talking with a pastor, a friend of mine, and uh, he's a pastor in Camden, uh, not Pastor Garris, but another pastor, and um, we were having a good conversation, and he said this phrase, he said this phrase, and maybe you've heard this phrase, maybe you haven't, but he said this phrase, he said, you just have to keep, no, yeah, you, you have to stay on the swivel, you have to stay on the swivel, you know what that means? Has anybody heard that phrase before? Yeah, like kind of nobody. Brian, did you hear that phrase before? I th- you did? Okay, Brian did. He like reads a lot and stuff like that. So you got to stay on the swivel. What does it mean to stay on the swivel? And I said, yo, whoa, whoa, time out, time out. What does this mean, stay on the swivel? He goes, oh, that's a military term. They used to say that in the military, and he's got a military background. He said, they used to say that in the military when I was there. And what they were saying was, you've got to keep your head focused all around. You've got to know your surroundings, front, back, side, wherever it is. You've got to keep your head on the swivel in a protective kind of a sense. And it was really a great uh, il- illustration, analogy. And I said, man, I'm going to use that in a message one day. So today's the day I get to use that in a message. Um, Paul says this. He says, walk circumspectly. That's in the King James language. What a great word. When's the last time you used circumspectly? Right? When you drive in the Wawa parking lot, you got to drive circumspectly. You say that to your teenage kids all the time, I'm sure, right? Um, When you go and cross the street, you've got to walk circumspectly. You've got to know your surroundings and walk circumspectly. You've got to know what's in front, beside, all around you. You need to know your surroundings in order to go forward to keep yourself protected. And that's a military kind of sense, or it's a protective sense. It's that I'm protecting myself. And, and I've got a few people illustrating this today, so Gabe's going to illustrate that for us. Gabe, you ready? He fell asleep. Come on, Gabe. So Gabe's ready for this. He's walking circumspectly with us today. And so here's the, the thing. I asked him to kind of dress up in something that's, you know, that looks like this. This is, he's raring to go, and he's ready for a Nerf war. And like, I knew I could ask him because this is not my first time seeing him dressed up like this, right? <laughs> and I'm like, who would, who would walk circumspectly like this? Gabe, okay? And he comes armored, ready, and he's got all kinds of fun things in all these pockets, I'm sure. I'm hoping there's no mace in there or anything like that that's going to hurt anybody. But, but he's walking circumspectly. When he goes into battle, in a nerf battle, he's going in not just kind of in shorts and, you know, T-shirt and flip-flops like, hey, guys, what's going on? No, he's raring to go. He's going into the woods. He's going not to, to lose, not to get shot, but he's going in it to win it. And that's walking circumspectly from a protective sense, almost a defense and offensive at the same time, okay? You get it? All right, you can sit down now. Thanks. That was it. Like, you dressed up for that one moment of fame. There's your 15 seconds, okay? You can ask all your friends to watch on YouTube, and they're going to see him later on. Okay, so here's the, the reality of what we're talking about today. It's not about protecting ourselves, though, that I want to talk about staying on the swivel, It's actually about looking at others and adding value to others, adding value to others. It's that what I'm encouraging us to do today is that when we look around at everyone in our lives, we are looking to add value to every single person that we come in contact with or everyone on our friend list or everyone that we're hanging out with, everyone in our home that we're looking very intentionally and we're saying, I want to add value to your life. I want to add value to your life. And that's what God calls us to do as Christians, as followers of Jesus, that we're looking to add value to people. What does it look like to add value is the question. Well, I'm going to illustrate that. I've asked Samantha to help me illustrate this. Okay, because Gabe, on the other hand, is is all armed up and ready to go for battle. And Samantha, come on up here. Okay, 
And uh, she's prepared. She's ready for this. She knew she was getting volunteered today. Um, and uh, I wanted her to know ahead of time because she's got to dress up for the part. Okay? So in order to do this, here's what I want to do. And we just had the Avengers movie, right? And, and all this. Here, you can stand up here. This is awesome. Okay, so we had the Avengers movie and everything. So I'm thinking... Listen, if you're going to add value in the way that God wants you to add value, this is a superhero trait of a true follower of Jesus. Yes? Yes. Joyce agrees. Does anyone else agree? (laughs) Hey, she'll catch that on YouTube later on, and you can tell your family and friends, I'm on YouTube. All right. So here's what I did. Designed a shirt. Value plus. You want to add value? All right. You got this? She's going to put this on. Okay, so, so here's the reality. When you look in your life at people around you, what you should be doing is you should say, how can I add value to, to you? So in order to do that, you have to see others as valuable. Yes? So, all right, exercise. You get to participate. Turn to the person next to you or closest to you and say, point, like, take your finger. Point at them and say, you are valuable to me. Awesome. All right, now some of you are getting romantic with this, and that's not what we're trying to do. Okay, so... um, Let's kind of pull it back. to We're in church, people. Okay. You are valuable to me. What if you walked around in your life? What if at your job? What if at your school? What if in your house? What if in your neighborhood you looked at other people and said to other people, literally, it came out of your mouth, you are valuable to me. Would that be nuts? Would it take you some Xanax to get there? A couple drinks? Now, 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 listen. Now, listen. I want to pull it down to where we are because I think a lot of times, a lot of times, we're not seeing enough value in others. And I want to encourage us there because there's a lot of value to see in others. Now, I'm not leaving you hanging. Okay, you ready? Okay, so. A person that is overflowing with God's love will add value to others. A person that is overflowing with God's love will add value to others. To overflow with God's love looks like I am allowing God to pour into my life value. He loves me. He loves me so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to come to this earth. He came to me while I was away from him. He came to me. He came to where I was. And he said, I love you so much that I'm going to give my life for you to pay for the sin that separates you from God. Not in a simple way of, oh, he got the flu, got pneumonia, and he just died and kind of fell over and that was it, or instant heart attack. But he went through the pain and suffering that he did out of love for us. When we grab a hold of that, when we hear that, when we allow that to absorb into our hearts and we're filled up with this, it should be overflowing. But here, let me describe two different types of people here today. There are two different types of people. Everybody listening? Look, look up here. This is really important. There's two different types of people. This morning, I got a cup of coffee. And it's important that I poured the cup of coffee into a cup without holes. You were lost there for a second. Come on, people. Here we go. Okay? Because I would not be able to drink it if it, wasn't, if it had holes in it. There's two different types of people. There's a cup that God is pouring into you, and you're getting filled up, absorbed, and it's filling up and filling up, and you continue to be filled up with God's love, and you understand him. You get to know his character. You see how he works in your life, and you see how he's working in other people's life, and you're getting filled up, and it becomes this thing where it's overflowing into other people's lives. That's one type of person. And then there's the other type of person, and this, this is who I'm describing in the pew today. There's another type of person, that you are not a cup, you're a funnel, that you look just like a cup, you look just like something that can pour and can have water hold it, it looks just the same, 
But instead, it's very different. It's not an object that is absorbing and holding on to and letting it fill up. It is instead something that the water or whatever is poured into it just flows right on through and it doesn't hardly touch the thing that it's being poured into. And oftentimes you can come to church with two different perspectives, the funnel or the cup. You come in with a funnel perspective and you're like, can we get this over with? Is he done yet? Is he done yet? Is he done yet? And that's the funnel. I can't wait for this to be over. And then there's the other side, that's the cup saying, okay, I came in, I was praying up, I'm ready, I can't wait, I want to hear what does God have for me, and I'm going to apply this later on today. There's two different sides. And I think there's too often the tendency for every one of us is to be more of a funnel than a cup. And so I want to encourage you today to be a cup, not a funnel. And allow God to fill you up and overflow into other people's lives. Because when you do that, when you're filled up with God's love, instead of being a funnel, because look, it can look identical. Do you realize a pastor can be a funnel, not a cup? Do you realize a worship leader can be a funnel, not a cup? And a teacher and a greeter and everyone in the church could be a funnel, not a cup. In that what you do is you're saying, God, pour into me and that's all good and everything, but don't touch me, don't change me, don't do anything in my life to make me overflow this way. And what happens is it goes through you and goes to other people and goes out and it looks very similar, but it's very dissimilar. It's very opposite. And this is where hypocrisy really comes in down the road, where you have character issues and competency issues that f- flow out of these things. Now, that's a whole other message, but I, I just want to introduce that idea to you. So today, I want you to be a cup that allows God to pour His love into you. He loves you so much that He gave Jesus Christ as your Savior. Have you accepted Him as your Savior yet? Are you living for Him? It's challenging, I know, but it's worth it. So out of that, then, we give value to others because he looked at us and said, you are absolutely so valuable, so valuable that I'm taking my one and only son, and he's going to give his life for you, okay? So because of that, we're adding value to others. And so we all get to put this t-shirt on, and we get to be the superhero that says value plus. Now, a superhero really needs A cape. Awesome. All right. It's really a tablecloth, but don't worry about that. Okay. All right. And that's what a superhero needs. A superhero needs the cape, you know, where you go around and and you feel it. You see it in yourself. You're like, I get to add value to people because God add value to me. Without God, I don't have value, but because of God, I've got value. This is awesome. We're going to talk about that today. This changes everything. It's this that gives you purpose for living. It's this that gives you a reason to get up in the morning. It's this that makes life so valuable. It's that he's poured into you and you're overflowing out of that and pouring into others. All right, Sam, you want to sit down? Okay, cool. (laughs) Take your cape with you. (laughs) But you're going to come back up. All right, so you're cool. All right, awesome. Thank you. Okay, so we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. And here's my statement that I want you to kind of grab onto. If you haven't grabbed onto this first one, a person that's overflowing with God's love will add value to others. That's the first statement you've got to grab onto. And here's your second one. Look for creative ways to add value to others. Look for creative ways to add value to others. And we're going to talk about that. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're finishing out this book of 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 5, verse 12. How do you add value to others is the question. We ask you, brothers, in verse 12, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. Now, who's that referring to in verse 12 and 13? Well, most, of, most people would say this is referring to the pastor of the church or a church leader or your teacher or whatever in, in a church setting. Often they would refer to this as a pastor, and he refers to pastors a couple times through the book of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians and how you view pastors within the church. How should you view a pastor? You should rev- uh, view them with respect, and you should view them in, and regard them highly in love because of their work. That's how you should view them. So what is the work of a pastor is the question. Like, here's how you should treat a pastor, but why? Is it just because of the position? 
No, here's what a pastor is really called to do. I'm not called to be the top. I'm called to be the bottom. I'm not called to be the one that, that everybody focuses in on at church. What I'm called to be is that I'm called to be your servant that's looking to feed, looking to care for, looking to love on you and, and add value to your life in a way that God has called me to add value to your life. That's what I'm called to do. And some people take this and they say, well, that means you should call the, that guy up front or whatever. You should call them a pastor or a bishop or a reverend. I don't care what you call me. I'll say that straight. Next generation, they're not into titles. I get it. Okay? I don't care if you call me pastor or bishop. Don't come, call me reverend because I don't think I should be reverend. Only God should be reverend, but that's my opinion. But anyway, here's the reality. Here's the reality. The best thing you can do is you can follow the Lord Jesus Christ, and we can respect others all together. When you have a, a teacher downstairs in kids' church that's teaching your kids, you should show them love and respect. Yes? Why? Because they're encouraging kids to follow Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter who's up front sharing God's word. There should be a respect for, hey, thank you for laboring all week or all month or all year for this message that you're bringing to me. For me, this is a repetition that I get to do every week. For others that stand up here, some of the elders, they're like once a year preach. That's all I want to do, just once a year. And they work on it for months and months to come up with this message. You should give them the respect and the love because of what they're doing. Fair enough? Okay, so outside of that, here's the point that I, I, I want to get to. Here's what a pastor, here's what a teacher, elder, and here's what they're supposed to be doing. They're giving their lives to add value to people around them. They're coming with, with the band-aids, and we're, they're coming with different things. They're coming with the, the resources to be able to help your life, to, ha- to, to, to give value to your life in different ways. They're coming with the spiritual truths of God's Word to say, hey, listen, yeah, your finances or your marriage or your relationships or whatever, it's not going well. Let me show you where God can help to straighten this out. That's the admonishment part. And then there's the encouragement part where, man, I just lost or I'm just going through, and it's... I get it. Let me give you some borrowed courage. And we work at that and work at that and work at that. So that really should be the example of what's going on in the church altogether, and we should all be doing this. So then here's, here's how this works itself out in the next verse. Verse 14. We urge you, brothers, to admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God. And do you get it? We good? He's just giving them a quick bullet point after bullet point after bullet point, so we should be like, all right, I get it, let's go, let's pray, let's go home, right? Let me explain some of these thoughts. Here's the first one. He says, admonish, admonish them and encourage them. What is it to encourage somebody? Have, how many of you have been discouraged? To be discouraged is I, I fail to have the courage to get up and get moving, to do what I need to be doing. I'm struggling to get up. I, I'm just discouraged. I'm without the energy, the strength, the courage to keep going. To encourage is to give that borrowed courage to someone. It's to look at them and to see that they need that encouragement in certain ways. He says, admonish the idol. And I, I believe this is kind of the central thing is encouragement. And it goes back to admonishing. Admonishing is a form of encouragement where you're saying, listen, I want to help you to do the right thing. It's in that tone. I want to admonish you in a way where I'm helping you not to be idle, not to sit still and to do nothing with your life and not to be indifferent, but for you to step up and do the right thing. That's the encouragement. The other one is to encourage those that are without courage. And how do you do this? He says, encourage the faint-hearted, those that are just weak. Be patient with them all. You're patient. (laughs) I find that people that get discouraged... It doesn't take one conversation. It takes walking through the season that they're going through with them. You know what that looks like? It's two different parts of this. If you're brand new here, and we're glad if you're brand new here, that's awesome. If you're looking for the bathroom at some point in time, and you ask somebody in the back, 
say, hey, I'm looking for the restrooms. And I never like asking for where the restroom is. I don't know why, because what it does is it admits that I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> like, like, it's so embarrassing. I've got to go to the bathroom. We all have to go to the bathroom at some point in time. I don't know. But that's just how I am. Anybody with me there? Okay, so good. Not everybody understands, but some people are like, yeah, I hate asking to go to the bathroom. And if I go to a brand new place and I'm asking to go to the bathroom, hey, uh, where's the restroom? You know, there's two different types of people. There's the one that says, oh, it's downstairs. And it is. If you go down the stairs, because I've been here a million times probably, and I walk past these bathrooms a million times, I, I, I think that'd be sufficient to say, just down, go down the stairs. Now, if you're in a brand new place, you go down the stairs and you feel a little bit like, what's down there? What are they going to do? Is this a secret society down here? Right? And so you go down, and you're like, oh, yeah, I really got to go to the bathroom now, you know. And, and maybe it's not that fearful, but you kind of go down with a little bit of concern because you're going into the unknown. Now, what about a handicapped person or someone who's blind or someone who's really struggling? <coughs> Often, what we do is we say, yep, it's, it's down the steps. What we should do. And I'm not saying this is the practice of our church. What the practice of our church should be is to say, Oh, let me take you to where it's at, right? Which feels better? I mean, I think when I'm in a building, I can't stand it when I, I go in and, and they say, oh, just take a left and then a right and then a go. And, and you're like, oh, I lost it after the left, okay? And so I, I prefer when someone says, oh, let me show you where it's at. When I'm at the store and they say, and I'm looking for a certain something, and I say, where is it? And they say, oh, it's aisle 14. That's so different than, here, let me go with you to get it off the shelf with you. Very different. To encourage someone is to go with them to where they need to go. Instead of pointing them and saying, it's over there. You'll find your encouragement if you do this, that, and the other thing. Very different than, man, let me walk through life with you as, you as you're experiencing this. Totally different. Someone who has that, that value plus with the cape on, they view their lives as, as going with someone on a journey to encourage, to help, to be there with them. And when you do that, guess what you must be doing? Here, I'm going off camera again. Andrew, you ready? I'm sorry. He's killing him. All right. When you do that, when I go with him, what that does is, if I'm over here, I'm hanging out with Brant. Yo, man, we're talking about trucks, right? Because we like to talk about trucks and motorcycles and stuff like that, because that's our cool thing. And someone comes up, and, and they say, hey, listen, where's the restroom? And I hardly stop the conversation. Oh, it's down the steps, and go right back to it. How do they feel? Yeah, not valued. Now, how hard was that for me to stop in the mid-sentence? It was hard, right? All right, she knows. Now, let's go a little further. How hard is it to say, hey, Brent, I'm going to catch up with you in a couple minutes. I have some new friends here that I want to show them where things are at. And what if? It was five or six people having the phenomenal conversation. We're laughing, we're crying, we're not crying like bad tears, guys. We don't do that with good tears. Like you're laughing so hard that tears are coming out. Okay, good. Just clarifying that. I'm kidding. But I have this awesome conversation, and they are looking for. Isn't that hard to? to walk away from the thing that you're having so much fun doing and you're walking with someone that you don't know or someone that you know a little bit about that's not fitting in with this crowd over here that you're part of, that's encouragement. That's the difference. There's a big difference between pointing them somewhere or going with them. And it will take sacrifice to walk away from the conversation that you're in to be able to go with on the journey to the place that they need so much. And it will be different. It will change your geography. It will change the conversation. But listen, when you're overflowing with God's love for, uh, for, you, for you, 
then you will understand that He left heaven to come to us. Do you see it? How encouraging. See, that fills me up. That fills me up. All right, let's keep moving. I have so much. I, I could spend the entire message on any one of these points, I'm just saying. So we'll keep on. I may come back to one of these because i got so much going on. So let's keep moving. Verse 15. He says, See that no one repays, e- repays anyone evil for evil, but always, 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 always. Did you catch that? What's always mean? In the Greek, in the original language, when you look it up in the Greek, it really does mean always. Okay? In the English language, always means always. Always, always means always. Okay, you with me? Always, but when they irritate me. Always, but when they're not nice to me. Always. You catching this yet? Always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Always do this. Always do something nice for them. Always do good. Don't try to even the score. Jesus says it this way. Turn the other cheek. Add value to them. Always. Always. It's to look at them in the same way that you just did a few minutes ago and to say, you are so valuable to me. In Philippians chapter 2, Jesus says that he came and he, he emptied himself of all the godly attributes in order to come to this earth. He emptied himself because he looked at us and he said, you are more important, you're more valuable than staying where I am. I must go to where you are. So he did the best thing he could do for us, the only thing, the most loving thing he could do for us. In the same way, because of the flow of love that goes into our cup, that f- overflows out, we go and we say, I need to add value to you by doing good to you. Even when you get on my nerves, even when you're not so nice, even when fill in the blank, always, always do something nice for them. Verse 16, one of the shortest verses in the Bible, rejoice when, how often, what's always mean? Oh man, it says it again, always, always means always, okay? It always is always. Rejoice always. How do you rejoice always? Listen, time out here. Rejoicing is, is identified with happiness. How do you be happy with other people? How do you live a happy life? There's a lot of people that you prefer to live a miserable life, and you're like, I don't prefer it. It's the circumstances I'm dealt with. I would be happy if, fill in the blank. Here, let me give you a couple. If my neighbor was nicer to me, I would be happy. If my spouse, if my husband, if my wife did, I would be happy. I would be able to rejoice. Listen, that dream vacation of going down to Cancun, if that's your thing, or going to Alaska, if that's your thing, or going to Europe, if that's your thing, wherever you are dreaming about going, I would be able to rejoice always if this dream came true. If I was living, listen, absolutely, if I was in Cancun or Alaska and Europe, wherever I was, if I was there, I would be able to rejoice. Of course I would. And so we look at the rejoicing as a circumstantial thing that we should be going through. It's very dependent, then, on the things that are going on around us, rather than a life that we're living internally. This is an overflow. How do you rejoice always? In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13, the whole book of 1 Peter, Peter is, uh, is talking through this whole thing on suffering, and he says this about suffering. He says, rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering. Rejoice in suffering. Kind of sounds sadistic. You should be happy when you're going through suffering. (laughs) When pain is occurring around you, you should be rejoicing. So let's pour into our cup because this is really confusing, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I can't stand suffering. Anybody with me? Right? <laughs> I don't like to go without. I don't like suffering. I don't like hardships. Nope. I, I, I like comfortable. Okay? And you get it because that's what we work for. Here's Jesus. Picture this. Adding value to us by going to the cross for us. And while he's on the cross, and the nails are through his feet, 
holding his feet to the cross and his hands are holding his, his hands on the cross. Do you know that as he was there, the tension of the nails pulling would pull his, his fingers and the tension of his nerves in such a way that he would literally be doing this number, right? How much pain must that have been? And I can picture in my mind as he's sitting there being hung on the cross, kind of pointing out and saying, Father, forgive them. To rejoice is to know I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing what would please God. I'm doing this because this is what God would want me to do. To rejoice in that is an overflow out of, hey, this is what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And I get to live out these sufferings. I understand that they, they hated Jesus, they're going to hate me. I get that. And, and, and so you see Peter and, James, or Peter and, and, and John in the, in the book of Acts, when they get put into prison, they get beat. What are they doing the next day or that, later that night? They're singing. They're like, yeah, this is awesome. Not because I'm in pain, but because I was counted worthy to suffer for Jesus Christ. And you walk that all the way through and you see people that are suffering for Jesus, that are going without, that are sharing, that are being generous, that are living in a way that's totally outside of the norm. Not living for themselves, not living for comfort, not living for a me monster, but they're living for Jesus Christ. He says, rejoice always. If you're waiting for all the circumstances in your life to align in a way that, that fits you, then you're not rejoicing at all. And you never will. You'll live a life that's just waiting and waiting. Well, if the kids at school would be nicer to me, well, you know, if my parents would, or if my kids would, or if my finances would, and, and you're living that way, there's always going to be something else to fill that empty hole. That says, well, I, I finally got that dream vacation, but the, the, the plane was late. Right? I mean, you just fill in the blank anywhere. Guaranteed, there'll be something that takes it away. So this is something that happens inside of you that comes out of your love for Jesus because he loved you first. And so out of that springs out because you love him. You say, okay, God, you're sovereign. You know what you're doing. And so I'm going to rejoice in the things that are going on in me, even suffering, even pain, even hardship. And we're going to get to that a little bit more in a second here. So here's the next thing he says in verse 17. Another short little clip. Pray without ceasing. Pray all the time. Pray without ceasing. So pray for others. So be happy with others. Pray for others. You pray for strength. You pray for encouragement. You pray to be able to help others. To pray effectively. Do you realize that in order to pray effectively, you must know yourselves? We must know what's going on inside of us. In order to know what's going on inside of me, guess what I have to do? Stop. I've got to stop and feel. I've got to stop and process, stop and think. I've got to hold on and say, okay, God, this is really what's going on. I want to rejoice always, but I'll tell you what, this person's really making my life miserable. So God, help me understand this. But you have to stop and pray. In order to pray for others, guess what you need to do? You've got to know what's going on in their life right? You can't just, I'm praying for you. Um, what are you praying for? This is why as a church, the direction that we're heading is to build into our church a group, that, a group of people that meets in small groups as well. That we meet in this large gathering to get main teaching kind of th uh, uh, on a weekly basis, and we meet together in this way. But then as well, we're working on small groups. And over the summer, there's going to be another small group that, that we're getting going so that we can get together, we can collaborate, get to know each other, we can build each other up, and we can pray for each other. Why? Because we need it. Because God commands it. Because that's what a church is supposed to do. Not get together, sit in rows, and never talk to people. Listen, that's fine. Like, you can go ahead and do that, but that's not church. That's just a religious gathering. You have somebody that can speak up front and you're good to go. No, church is when you actually practice your gifts and you care for one another, you reach out to one another, and you pray for each other. And that's the direction that we're heading over the next few months here. <clears throat> the, the next thing, verse 18, he says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This is so hard. 
This is to appreciate everything. So you show appreciation for others. To appreciate everything. How do you do that? Here's here's the reality. When you look at other people, you're either going to look at them through the lens of irritation and annoyance and avoid them, or you're going to look at them through the lens of God's perspective on them, and you're going to be thankful for them. What about people that are hard on you? What about people that annoy you? What about people that that really just cause pain in your life? Can you be thankful for them? Give thanks in how many circumstances? Ah, this is so challenging, isn't it? To follow Jesus looks like I'm giving thanks in all circumstances. When Jesus went to the cross prior to that, hours before, he's praying in the garden and he's saying, not my will, but thine be done. And, and it, it, you, you, you carry that through and you see just this gratitude of this is what I get to do. And you see that through his life. This is what I get to do. This is God's will for my life. I get to be here. In order to give thanks in all things, you have to, first of all, have a high enough view of God to know that God is in control of everything. That God's got this. God's not out of control. God's got everything in control, and he knows what he's doing, and he's okay with the things that he's got planned for our lives, and that as things are going on in our lives, he's going to continue to grow us and change us to be more like him, and that's in the next couple verses he talks about that. So here's the reality. In doing that, you're able to show appreciation to others and, and show appreciation in your own life for everything that's going on. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, here's what Paul does. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. Paul is going through this really challenging time. And he's very close to God. And while he's going through this challenging time, he goes and he prays to God in, in this way that I would say is a little bit different than just a sentence prayer. He prays to God and says, God, this pain in my life, this thorn in my flesh is so painful. This circumstance is so messed up. I want you to remove this thorn, this pain out of my life. Have you ever been there? Lord, I need you to remove this financial pressure. Lord, remove this spouse. I don't care what you got to do. Remove this, whatever. And, you know, I have different things in your life that you say, Lord, if you just remove this neighbor, remove this boss, remove this, and you put all those things out on the table, and you say, Lord, something's wrong here. It can't be me, but if you'd remove them, I'll be better off. Right? And that's what Paul's saying. Lord, you got to remove this thing from me. I've got this pain in my life that just got to go away. In order for me to serve and follow you, this has to go away because I'm having a hard time following you here. And what does God say back to him? He says, in, 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 uh, he goes in, he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me this, he says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Here's what God says back. Hey, listen, time out. <laughs> I'm in control, and guess what? I'm going to pour into you. Are you a cup or a funnel? Cup or a funnel. Paul, I'm pouring into you my grace, and it's going to overflow out of you that when you're empty and you're weak and you don't have anything going on, I'm pouring this grace into your life so that my power will be made perfect in your weakness, and you will overflow with my grace. So what's Paul's response? You see, God says this to many different people, and there's two different responses. One is, nope, I want to be a funnel, not a cup. I'm walking away from you, God. I'm doing my own thing. A lot of people do that. And then there's others that say, okay, here's what I want to do, and here's what Paul says. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content in this, in weakness, with insults. How many like to be insulted? Isn't it fun? Facebook thing, you know, somebody's like, can you believe them? And they tag you in or whatever. Hardships, you like go through hardships? <laughs> yeah, please bring it on. That'd be so much fun. I, I like hardships. Right. Persecutions, how about calamities? My house burnt down. I lost everything. And the insurance said they're not covering it. He says, For the sake of Christ, I am content with all of these things. For when I am weak, when I'm without, when I'm just at the end, I've got nothing to offer. I can't do anything. I'm stuck. When I'm there, 
then I am strong. Why? Because the power of Christ is flowing in me, through me, and out. It's overflow. You see, that's the distinction. And then I can appreciate everything. And that's what he's saying. I will most gladly. I'm going to boast about this. I am thankful for this. Paul, you're really in pain, aren't you? You're really going through it. That's all right. This was good for me because it brought me close to God. And I was able to minister to them because of that. Talked to a guy yesterday going through cancer, going through divorce and different things in his life that he did not ask for. And this is going back a couple of years, and I was talking with him yesterday, and he said, you know, it's good. It was painful to go through all that, but God is using this in a way that I never thought I'd be used before. And I'm able to care for people that are going through divorce and are being rejected and hurt in a way that, because I, I can relate to them. And I can care for people that are going through cancer, that they've had the surgeries and they've had chemo and things. I can relate and I can care for them in a way that I never could before. What a perspective. That he's looking at his life as God pouring in so he can pour out to others. Lord, fill my cup with you, with your grace, so that I can give thanks in it. And say, God, you've got a plan. When I keep my head on the swivel and I stay on the swivel, I say, God, thanks for putting me into this painful, difficult, or struggling position. Show me where I add value. Show me where I'm to add value. So here's what happens in verse 19 through 24, the next few verses. I want to fly through. We could have a really big conversation here, but he says this amazing thing. Do not quench the spirit. Do not, don't douse the flame of God inside of you. Don't quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now, the may, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. He's going to set you apart. He's growing you. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless as the coming of Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. He's going to grow us and transform us into his image over time. So don't quench the spirit. God's working in us, so let him sanctify and grow us. We can quench the Holy Spirit by simply not adding value to others. Do you see it? We quench the Holy Spirit by saying, hey, listen, I'm not going to add value to you. I'm too bitter and angry and irritated with you. I can't even stand to look at you. You're, you just get on my nerves all the way around. So I'm not adding value to you. I see this happening. This is a normal part of life. In your teens, in your 20s, go all the way up, where we say, I've been hurt by you. What you do irritates me or gets on my nerves or whatever. You fill in the blank, and here's what happens. We quench the Holy Spirit when God prompts us and says, you should love them. I'm loving them by keeping them on the other side of the room. You don't know, Lord. Right? And he says, yeah, you didn't have nails through your hands, did you? You didn't have them cuss you out, did you? And put you on the cross and pull the beard out and beat on you and, and say all kinds of vile things. You didn't have that. What, it's not that what you went through is unimportant or not valuable. He's saying, in that pain, I want to be God in you. Not God at church. But I want to be God in you. That does amazing work in you so that you can then be a blessing to others. So don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't shove the Holy Spirit away. Don't douse the flame of what He's trying to do in you. You see, encouraging people, doing nice things, being happy with and praying for people and showing appreciation for them. Listen, that's so much easier when everything's going right, isn't it? It's so much easier. But here's the reality. God's calling us in this, and with his life, he's calling us to go and to be this, to add value to people, even when things aren't going our way. And here's the temptation. The temptation is that when we are crushed, we get cynical. I have, I'm, I'm, this is a drum I'm beating on. Cynicism in our culture is huge. 
I am cynical that I just don't see that you're going to do anything good anymore, so I just remove myself from you. I will talk nicely to you and put that plastic face on. But that's as far as we're going. You know what that looks like? All right, Noah, come on out. He can't hear me, can he? You ready? Come on out. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, didn't we? See, a cynical person says, I got hurt, so I'm putting on bubble wrap. You can't hurt me now. I, you know what? You disappointed me. You irritate me. You get on my nerves. And what you do, what you say, what you think, how you breathe, everything about you gets on my nerves. So I will protect myself. I'm putting on the, the bubble wrap. I will make sure that you cannot penetrate into me. And I'll give you the cheesy, happy smile. Because that's the Christian thing to do. Is it? That's not the Christian thing to do at all. Following Jesus goes a step beyond that, goes 10 miles beyond that. Following Jesus says, God, pour into me your grace, and I'm going to remove the bubble wrap and let you work in and through me to other people. All right, you can sit down now, thanks. Yeah, that was it. Got all dressed up for that. (coughs) You see... You see, here's the thing. We say, I would encourage, but how? They hurt me. So I put the bubble wrap on. I would do good, but I don't feel good when I'm with them. I would rejoice and be happy, but life stinks. I'm praying that I I get out of this mess, but I don't believe in that either. Like, I'll pray, but God's not going to do anything. I'm just doing it because the preacher said so when we're in church. I don't find much appreciation in anything. And here's the root cause. This is really important. Here's the root cause. The root cause is my belief is that God protects me from pain. God protects me from pain. Here's the root cause. God protects me from pain. Here's my belief. So when he fails me, I protect myself with the bubble wrap that I can come up with. What we're saying is, God, it's your job to protect me from pain. I'm not supposed to go through pain. I'm not supposed to go through hardships or difficulties. So here's the reality, God. We're making this deal. I'm praying, and here's my prayer. You protect me from pain, and when you do, I'll follow you. And when you don't, bubble wrap. And God says, no, 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 you totally missed the whole thing. Being a follower of Jesus looks like this. If he suffered, you're going to suffer. If he went through hardship, you're going to go through hardship. Do you realize how much, what, what was the net worth of Jesus while he's on earth? Anybody know? Zero? I heard a zero. Yeah, it was a zero. He had zero net worth. He probably had a negative because he borrowed a donkey at one point. He let him borrow. He's like, all right, cool, that sounds fine, you know. He didn't have a house. He had nothing but what was on him. No net worth. But boy, did he have value in God's eyes. You see, here's why I add value to others. It's because Jesus gives me value. Jesus gives me value. I don't add value to others because they add value to me. Here's the deceptive part. Here's what Satan wants to teach us. Satan wants us to buy into this whole backwards theology that says we add value into others that adds value into us. Because you can add value into me, because you have money, I'll add value to you. Because you're popular, I'll add value to you because you're going to add value to me. And so we do things like that, that we add value to others because we expect that they're going to add value to us. It's kind of like getting someone a gift so that they praise you in the gift that you, that you gave to them, and it makes you feel more valuable because of the praise that they gave to you for the gift that you gave to them. Do you see the cycle? You catch it? It's doing something nice so others can praise you for how nice you are. It's I value you for what you can give to me. That's not Christ-like as all, at all. What could we possibly give to God? So in a few minutes, we're going to give, the, the offering plates are going to come around, and you're like, Lord, I'm giving you this. And you think he's like, whew, man, this is so great. He owns everything. 
right? Is there anything that can impress God? <laughs> you see, he pours into us value because he just see, simply sees us as valuable. Because he loves us, because that's the way he works and operates. And in our church, in the way that we operate, my passion, my goal, is that we aren't looking to do things so that we can get. We're looking to add value to others because that's what God's called us to be. Right, Samantha? Here, come on. Last time. We, we want to add value to others. We, we want to be a church that walks around with the cape and the shirt that says, I'm here to add value to you. I'm here to add value to everyone that I come in contact with. And, and I see it from a lot of different perspectives. Let me just point a few people out as by way of public encouragement. I already pointed out Marcy and all the work that she does with Kids Church. And you, when you see her next, or if you have her cell phone, text her and say thank you. Honest. And if you could help to bear the burden of reaching out to kids, and here's the reality with her. She's not saying, I have to, and oh, woe is me. Actually, she says, I love doing this. I love reaching kids. I have to do this because the kids need Jesus. There's another person that gets overlooked a lot, and that's Kathy Jeffries. And she isn't, I'm going to embarrass her. This is fun. But, but this is encouragement. Here's the reality. Kathy, last summer, she said, hey, listen, uh, we're going to change programs. And I came to Kathy and Matt, and I said, and said, listen, in order to change programs, Kathy, you have the right gifts and abilities to pull this off. And Matt, you, you got, if you guys partnered up in this way, it would work out. And Kathy says to me, and I said, this is like, this is crazy. You have a, a one in ten chance of really pulling this off, right, Be- before we started. And that's how I felt. And she said, Pastor, I got it. I said, are you sure? And I gave her an out and gave her another out, right? And she pulled it off. She got the program turned around on Wednesday nights. And all through the year, they've been working and working and working hard at making things even better. But that the goal was by the end of the year, we would have a fully functional program that was going very well. And we're seeing that spread out and do some different things for next year. And we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. We're excited for that. Kathy, thank you. Man, you did a great job. It was a thankless job, Right? But, but she did it. And let me point out two other people. Um, Fred. Fred's in the back there. He does not want to be recognized, but that's all right. I'm doing it anyway. Um, when, when you come in, um, there's these new flower boxes outside. Fred was asked to do these flower boxes. A couple of ladies like, oh, it'd be so cool if we had flower boxes on those walls. Could we do that? And Fred's like, well, okay, I can build those things. They're really cool looking. Asked Fred to do some trim in the back, and, and he doesn't want to be recognized. He didn't want his name played up or something like that. That wasn't it. But he did it because he loved Jesus and wants to see things keep going forward in different ways here. How exciting. Exciting to see the ladies that are like, hey, if we had flower boxes, we can do it. And well, it's awesome. One other person. Really excited for what Andrew's done on the website and Facebook and different things. That, our website is, is really a top-notch website. He does a lot of work in that and making that just right. And uh, I'm sure there's probably a misspelling somewhere on that website, but we've really come through and we try to make it just right. Um, but, and I'm hoping he doesn't put Hippie Bill up after this message because I'm embarrassing him. But here's the reality. Um, he works really hard and here's his goal. Here's his whole purpose. It's so that people would get to see who Jesus is online. He's the one that came to me and said, hey, listen, Pastor, we really need to start videotaping the messages because that's what's going to be best to put out on our website and on YouTube. He convinced me. It wasn't me saying, oh, I've got this pretty face that should be on YouTube. No, that wasn't it. And if you have any idea how difficult that is, knowing that it's forever up there for everybody to look at, and, and, and they can pause when your face is making these kind of things, and look at how stupid, and don't do that later on. That's not a good dinner conversation. But here's the thing. Because of his passion and desire for God to to be known in our community and to be known in the online community, he stepped out and said, hey, I'll sacrifice my time and and comfort to make this happen. And he edits and and things to make all of that happen. It's awesome stuff. And I'm just highlighting a few. There's several people here. There's many people here that are a key part of making sure things go on here. And that's just here. Listen, if you can't do it here, then you're probably not going to do it at home or in your community. Do you follow me? Like, if you're struggling to, to love on people and to, be, to add value to people here, you're going to have a really hard time doing it at home and in your neighborhood and at work because this is the easiest place to do that because we're kind of normal. 
most of us, right? And it's expected to live this way. It's expected to be forgiving. It's expected to be grace-filled. So it should be easy. So this is your testing ground. So here's what I'm going to do. Thank you. You can sit down. Awesome. Let's give everybody a hand for all the work that they did, making it great. So take out your response cards with me. It's on, your, on the bulletin that you got or on the program that you got. And on the bottom, there's this response card. You can fold it one way, fold it the other way, and it's going to be ready to tear off. Okay? But don't tear it off yet because I want you to write on here. And here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking to see if God's touched your heart with this message. If you're a cup or a funnel, my expectation is that there's 75% participation in this, 75% or more, because there's always somebody that says, I'm not writing this down, okay? Hopefully that's not you, okay? I'm looking for encouragement, and I'm looking to pray for you throughout the week in this, because I know what I've asked you to do this today is huge. So here's what I'm asking you to do. The first thing, I'm ready to follow Jesus as my Savior. Check that off if you're here today saying, you know what, I've never accepted Jesus as my Savior, and today's the day that I need to accept Jesus as my Savior. And, and listen, we want to follow up with you. We want to pray for you. We want to be excited for you and, and, and be able to just care for you and, and minister to you, to you there. So if that's where you're at, we've talked about that throughout, throughout the message. Let us know that, and we'd love to follow up with you. The next one. I will add value to blank. Put a first name. Don't put the last name or maybe initials because you're like, well, I don't want the pastor to know. Like, if it's, you know, me that you're like, he really needs some help. or I don't, Whoever it might be, I don't care how you put it, but so that you know who you're adding value to, right? It could be the person next to you that you want to put it in a cryptic way. Or maybe it's a person in front of you, behind you. Or maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's somebody at work or whoever it is. And you say, God's prompting me. God's pouring into me. And I'm not going to quench the spirit anymore. I'm not pushing God off anymore. God, what you're doing to me is what I want to do. So this person, I will add value to this person by doing this one thing. You figure out which it is. What do you need to do today? Do you need to encourage them? Do you need to do something nice for them? Do you need to be happy with them? Do you need to pray for them? Do you need to show appreciation for them? What is it that you need to do? What's God teaching you today? Or maybe at the bottom, maybe this is for you. Maybe you say, I confess. I'm just going to say it straight, Pastor. Here's where I'm really at. I am cynical and struggling to add value to others. I want to pray for you no matter where you're at. So we're in church, so be honest. Right? So take a moment to fill that out. And if this is your first time here, would you fill out the other side for us so we can follow up with you? Just welcome you appropriately to our church and see if you have any questions, see if, how we can help so, we, so that we can journey through this life with you. And then when the guys come forward and they give uh, the opportunity for us to give, we can, we can tear this off together in an embarrassing way, make all kinds of noise. Ready? Okay? So you get to do it too. Everybody should be doing this, okay? And uh, make some noise. Noah's making noise with bubble wrap, so it works out. It's kind of drowning it out. And as the offering comes around, then you'll be able to give him. And, and that's, your, your, that's what God's doing in your heart, that you're giving that out. And the only people that see that are the leadership team in the church. They're the ones that pray over this, and we communicate, and we pray for you guys all the time. So, Jamie, why don't you come and close us out here with the offering?